Happy Holidays everyone, and welcome back to d and December 2019. We're now on week three, the days have just been flying by, but I have enjoyed every minute of this holiday season. Uh, actually, yesterday I slipped on the ice while walking my dog. I didn't enjoy that minute. But overall, the past three weeks have been filled with festivities, merriment, and of course, drawings of Dungeons & Dragons characters. If you didn't join us for the first two weeks, feel free to check out those videos to get an idea of what this challenge is, and how you can join in on the fun and be sure to catch up on the lore that I've created for these characters. I have seven new characters to introduce to you all, and I can't wait to see what you guys think, so without any further ado, let's begin. Here is my process and commentary for the seven designs for week three of d and December. Enjoy! We started this week off with day 13, the species prompt of which was Knoll. Knolls are definitely one of D&D's more obscure races, but despite my limited experiences with the game, I have actually encountered them in one of my campaigns. Now, I know that typically Knolls are basically anthropomorphized hyenas, but why put limitations on a fantasy world where all of the characters are made up anyway? My Knoll was much more wolf or husky life, sticking with a wintry theme. This was also the first character that I rolled Ranger for their class, so I finally had an opportunity to work with some new gear. I've been playing a lot of Warwick in League of Legends lately, and the idea of some kind of obsessive hunter seemed to work well for a Null Ranger. But I had to give it a festive twist, so I made Snaps the Hunter of Men. Well, the Hunter of Gingerbread Men. Snaps was once part of a large tribe of Null Bandits that patrolled the barren tundras of the Northern Lands seeking out weary travelers for easy meals. But unlike his fellow hunters, Snap soon became tired of cold, chewy flesh, and discovered that his palate craved something with a little bit more zest to it. So he abandoned his pack and traveled to the enchanted forest of Tannin Evergreen, where it was rumored that candy grew on trees and cookies could walk like men. This of course meant that the cookies could run like men, be hunted like men, and give a good chase. Uh, but unlike men, with their sinewy limbs and excess of chewy, tasteless fat, Snap's new prey was crispy and sweet, with a kick of ginger and tasty little gumdrops that had a texture similar to eyeballs, if he remembered correctly. Next up, on day 14, we had Troll for our prompt. Noel then Troll. Anyway, trolls have a pretty well-established reputation throughout almost every world existing in the fantasy genre. They're big, they're ugly, and they're not too keen on sunlight. And in some instances, they can appear with two or more heads. And that's really where my interest in this design fell. The idea of a character with two heads is nothing novel, but it can be a lot of fun, especially if the two heads have polar opposite personalities. And considering my holiday themes, I bet you could guess which two adjectives I decided to base this two-headed troll off of. Adel and Impa were born conjoined at the shoulders, and lived their whole life as one body with two heads. But despite experiencing every single moment of their lives together, the two have developed very different views of the world. Most who have met them would argue that Impa makes most of their choices for the both of them, while her brother Adel is just kind of along for the ride. It was only when Impa made the choice to join the Order of the Black Smog that the two began to butt heads. You see, Adel has a blindingly optimistic perspective of the world, and finds joy in sharing his positivity with others. Impa, on the other hand, sees things in much more black and white, and it's not just because of her hereditary colorblindness. In fact, she had potential to be the greatest assassin the Black Smog ever saw if it wasn't for her brother trying to sabotage every mission she had been assigned. Her last target was to be gutted and burned on a pike in front of his family. He ended up being gifted a whole spit-roasted pig for him and his three children. Impa still got paid though, somehow Adel managed to convince the Black Smog that the pig was actually her target.
Day 15 was Goliath, and while the name seems self-explanatory, I wanted to look up the race in the context of D&D so that I could include any subtle visual keys necessary for identifying them. Turns out, they're pretty much what I thought. Kinda just big people with cool face tattoos. Someone had suggested that if I did a golem for one of the races, that I make it Hanukkah themed, since golems originate from Jewish folklore, and in my head, I kinda mixed up Goliath and golem. And by the time I realized that they were completely different things, I was already dead set on making a Hanukkah design, so I stuck with it for my Goliath. I rolled yet another wizard, but I had an idea for him that I thought would work well with my holiday twist. Shinam, like so many casters in the Northern Lands, has focused his study of magic around the creation and control of light and warmth. When he started his work, he was a lonely wizard, isolated in an abandoned stone fortress that had been lost to time and the elements. He thought that this solitude would allow him to focus more on his studies. But as he mastered his spells, he began to attract the attention of travelers and locals who saw his flickering flames from miles away. He even caught the attention of Glaziella, the woodswoman of the peppermint bark, who in turn was able to uncover a long-forgotten warforged buried beneath the rubble of Shanam's old fortress. After some time, he had unknowingly amassed a small following of wayward souls, seeking warmth and shelter from the cold. And though a younger version of himself may have turned the intruders away, his own magic seemed to have melted his frozen heart, and he transformed the old fortress into a sanctuary of welcome and light. The magic that now sustains the sanctuary is kept alive by nine bright flames that rest upon his enchanted staff, and the focus of his studies is to continue to improve this magic, so that it may provide a safe haven for those seeking refuge from the storm for centuries to come. On day 16, I had to break out the old D&D manual because I had no idea what a gith was. Turns out they're kind of like the Falmer from the Elder Scrolls, a race of enslaved, oppressed nasties that look like they lost a game of Got Your Nose. Also, they hate each other, I, I guess. Or half of them hate the other half? But they all hate Olyphids, because those were the ones who enslaved them kind of a dark collection of lore, and while I like to be able to give new twists to pre-existing character tropes for a challenge like this, I thought of a better way to incorporate one of these green meanies into my holiday world. This was also my first time rolling Fighter for class. What I came up with was Sulfura, right hand of the singed king. Sulfura considered herself to be a very successful and independent gif. Broken from the shackles of her ancestry and the social constructs of her race, she roamed the land in total freedom seeking to make a new name for herself. But after an unfortunate encounter with an Illithid known as Cha'ok, she found herself making an enemy with a very powerful force. It was then that she was swayed into joining the ranks of the Black Smog, who shared a dislike for Cha'ok and his patron. She rose through the ranks of the cult incredibly quickly, surpassing members decades her senior. Soon she caught the attention of the Singed King, and was gifted a shard of cursed stone from the King's own reserve. But the stone began to consume Sulfura, giving her enhanced speed, strength, and cunning, but draining that which she had fought so long to achieve, her identity. And while she reigns powerful over the ranks of the Black Smog, she has ceased to be an individual, unique, now little more than a glittering yellow ring on the clawed hand of the great singed king.
Now, when I saw Eric Cockrell for the race of Day 17, I was immediately reminded of all the people who told me that my Kenku from Day 4 was actually an Arakakra. Whoops. I don't know who the authority is on fictional bird people, but I hope they forgive me for my deviation from the rules. Anyway, I was surprised to learn that there are in fact several differences between the two types of bird people people, that exist within the world of Dungeons and Dragons. I guess the biggest difference being that Kenku are more bird and Arakakra are more people. Hopefully there are no restrictions to what birds can be used to influence the design of said creatures, because I knew that I wanted to do a snowy owl for my second festive person. And after rolling Paladin, I had an idea on how I could tie in a festive element to this design. Akua loves the cold. She was born into it, raised by it, and as she grew, she tended to look down on people who had no tolerance for it. She saw them as weak, cowardly, and tended to take a personal offense to those who preferred the warmth of a fire to the cold, quiet beauty of a snowy night. Because of her views, she found herself ostracized by many that she met, unable to overcome her prejudices for those who disliked the cold. She ended up living alone in the dark solitude of the northern wilds. She was appalled one day to find her frozen sanctity shattered by a sudden eruption of light and warmth from what she had previously assumed to be an abandoned fortress. Snow melted and grass grew around its perimeter, and songs of joy and camaraderie could be heard from within. But upon entering the sweltering sanctuary, she was greeted not as a stranger coming in from the cold, but as a long-missed member of some giant family who had stopped in for the holiday. The many minds of the fortress, all with unique experiences and perspectives, did not turn her away for her love of the cold, but offered to enjoy it with her, as well as invite her to join in on their festivities around the fire. Now she serves as one of the guardians of the Nine Lights, protecting her new ideals as well as the people who share them with her. Whether you enjoy the shrouded vastness of the cold or the close warmth of a flame, all are welcome to join in the Sanctuary of the Nine Lights. Day 18 presented yet another new race of the vast world of D&D to me, the Asimar. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Basically, they're the spawn of angels. Pretty crazy stuff. For a moment, I contemplated doing something really crazy. Some kind of literal interpretation of Christian angels from the Old Testament. You know, rings of eyes, three faces, all that stuff. Instead, I settled on a cuter, if not a safe, festive angel concept. I hadn't done a design with predominantly a warm color scheme in days, so I wanted my ASMR wizard to really light up the night. My conclusion was Shantine, apprentice to the Lightweaver. For decades, aspiring casters had sought the tutelage of the cleric Tannin Evergreen. His powers far surpassed those of even most sorcerers, and his enchanted forest was well known, not just in the northern lands, but all around the world. Many who approached him were turned away for Tannen could see that their desire for power came from a place of greed and malicious intent. The only student he had ever taken on succeeded his mentorship decades ago, and it was this turtle who brought Tannen a young child who had been orphaned as an infant. The girl's name was Shantine, and she had asked for only one thing her entire life, to meet the elf who had lit up the dark forest of the northern lands. She feared more than anything the cold and the dark, and wanted to learn the magic of light weaving to protect herself and any other children who might find themselves alone and afraid. Tannin agreed to take her on as a pupil and raised her in his forest. There she grew, learning the mysteries of the long forgotten art of light weaving. She made many close friends in those years, including a knoll with a frightening sweet tooth and a human who was being learned in the craft of peppermint logging. As an adult, Shantine was the only wizard to have mastered light weaving at such a young age and is envied by other casters around the world. Tannen fears that her skills made her a target for assassins or bounty hunters, and has long forbade her from ever leaving the forest.
And finally, it's day 19, the last day of week 3. And once again, I've been introduced to another race in D&D that I have never heard of before. Know what a bugbear is? I know what you might think it is, because of its name, but no, it's not a bug, and it's not a bear. It's not even a bug bear, which is what I thought it was, because, you know, it's a bug bear. But it's not a bug bear, it's a bug bear. Which is basically a big hairy goblin. How was I going to turn that into a festive winter ranger? Well, I had an idea, and it was a little abstract, so bear with me. And that's a pun. Lobgung was long sought after by the Order of the Black Smog. In fact, every villainous gang had their eyes set on him, hoping to recruit him into their ranks before they ended up crossing him on a bad day. You see, unlike most bugbears, Lobgung was not a nomadic bandit. He wasn't a raider or a pillager, no. He took on a role with responsibilities more grueling than the most brutish barbarian could ever dream of. He was a single father, with three hungry mouths to feed. And as it turns out, bugbears actually make very committed parents. So committed, in fact, that Lobgung moved his family up and away from any dangers that might dwell at sea level. They now live in an isolated cave, far up in the slippery stone mountains. But this is not what the black smog found so appealing about him. What they wanted was his throwing arm. With a single throw, Lobgung could crush any potential threat that he spied climbing his mountain from hundreds of yards away. And you haven't been hit by a snowball until you've been hit with 140 pounds of solid snow and ice filled with rocks and bones and hurled at about 60 miles an hour. He's known as the Living Catapult, and his kids love being launched straight up into the air and caught. Most of the time. In fact, to prepare his children for a life of chaos and fear, he occasionally throws them at invaders he deems weak enough to be beaten by a six-year-old bugbear. And if they need backup, he'll throw another. He's got three. Alright, there it is folks, week 3 of D&D Sember come and gone. I hope you all enjoyed it, let me know in the comments which design was your favorite from this week. Mine was Shanam, I was really happy with how he came out, especially considering I don't usually draw old men with long beards. And like last week, we'll end today's video with a showcase of some of my favorite D&D Sember creations that you guys did this week. If you want your work shared in the next video, be sure to tag any D&D Sember designs that you do with the hashtag D&D Sember on Instagram, and I'll pick my favorites for next week. Happy holidays everyone, and I'll see you all in the next video.